Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks, thanks for coming this afternoon. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that we could coordinate this event with the uh, Prescott Police Department and Drs. Gertler and Barnes. This is one of the things that uh, I feel that the library does best, bringing people from all spectrums of our community together in a welcoming atmosphere. And I'm glad that Dr. Gertler and Dr. Barnes are willing to share, excuse me, <clears throat> are willing to share their personal stories with us about a trying time in our country's recent history. Um, the ideas that they're sharing are just as important today as they were in the past. And as a reminder, uh, you can explore more about the time period in some of our books and DVDs that we have in our collection. And uh, so I'll have more time for the speakers. I'm going to turn it over to Chief Moynihan. Thank you, Roger. Uh, certainly an honor to partner with the library uh, in this venture. My name is Gerald Monahan. I'm the chief of police here in Prescott, and uh, what an honor to serve as, as your chief of police. Uh, in working with the library, one of the things we acknowledge at the police department is the quality of life contribution that a library makes to our community. And for me, that's crime prevention. Uh, the library and the quality of life it adds to our community helps me lower crime. So, Roger, I'm indebted to you for that. Thank you. Uh, I had the, the very good uh, honor and privilege of meeting uh, Gene and, and Poco at a Martin Luther King Jr. march uh, here in, in Prescott. And uh, they um, very graciously provided me a copy of her book while I run this race. And in reading her book, um, I have the opportunity to, to teach law enforcement about issues around worldview, about perception, about bias, and uh, cultural issues. Um, and in reading her book, some things really stood out to me uh, that is a lived reality for her and her family. And if I could just mention a couple of those that um, were very compelling. The police could not be summoned. We dared not trust them. Where she grew up, the police were members of the Ku Klux Klan, and they were on their own. The police could not be counted upon to protect Negro citizens. The police were often the perpetrators. This was Poco's family's lived reality, and that doesn't go away just because she grows into adulthood. One of the things I can assure you that in policing in Prescott, your police officers here understand that people have a different worldview than they may have. We police under the principles of the Constitution not on our own worldview or on our biases. And I think you can be very proud of your police department and the men and women of your police department. I'm very proud to see uh, several of them here with us tonight. Thank you guys for coming in. Our commitment at the Prescott Police Department is to continue that practice, to serve all of our citizens with respect and honor, and to participate in activities like this, dare we forget what has been the lived reality for many of our citizens of color as they grew up and why they may think about police officers the way they do, uh, it's certainly understood. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Pocahontas uh, Gertler, and she'll be your first speaker tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chief Monahan, um, Mr. Sapp, and Ms. Zeman. And thank all of you for coming. My goodness. <laughs> Peace be with you. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Surely you recognize these noble words from the Gettysburg Address. They were spoken in 1863 by President Abraham Lincoln during the American Civil War and have become an integral and very important part of American history. 
Another interesting and integral and important part of American history is black history. The story of my father's ancestors who did not come to this country in liberty and definitely were not perceived as being equal. Rather, they arrived on these American shores shackled in bonds and chains, in the holes of slave ships, captives from Africa, to be bought and sold as property, to be used as chattel, with no more rights than cows or sheep, but were treated even more brutally than these lowly creatures. My mother's ancestors were already here, American Indians or Native Americans who were the original inhabitants of this continent. The genocide and takeover by the European invaders nearly wiped out the Indian population, but that is a different story for another day. As an African-American, Native American woman, I come from these two intertwined branches of the American history tree. My ancestors on both sides were granted neither the liberty nor the equality of which Mr. Lincoln so eloquently spoke. It has been a long, hard struggle for freedom justice and equality, this arduous journey from slavery, through reconstruction, through the Jim Crow era of segregation and the civil rights movement and into the present day. One might ask, why is it important to observe or celebrate black history or to study history at all? Most of us probably remember history classes in school as being dull and filled with rote memory of wars, calendar dates, ancient places, and dead white men. In my 25 years as a teacher in the public schools of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, I tried to make history come alive for my students so that they would become interested in and enthusiastic about history. I knew I had succeeded when during a lesson about Abraham Lincoln, a nine-year-old boy raised his hand, frantically exclaiming, Mrs. Gertler, Mrs. Gertler, you actually knew Abraham Lincoln? <laughs> Well, I'm pretty old, but not quite that old. It was indeed gratifying to share my, with my students of various grade levels knowledge about black heroes and heroines that I did know in person prior to, during, and after the Civil Rights era. A. Philip Randolph and Mary McLeod Bethune two nationally and globally recognized civil rights champions actually judged an oratorical contest that I entered and won when I was in junior high school. They impacted my life with a vision and I was forever changed. In my memoir entitled, While I Run This Race, I write about my experiences growing up in the Deep South in segregated America. It is a history that I, as a person of color, lived and experienced on a daily basis, enduring the many indignities and the thousands of microaggressions inflicted upon me, my family, my community, by ordinary white citizens. We were no strangers to the homegrown terrorism and threats rendered by the Klan and other white supremacists. I invite you to step back in time 
with me for a moment. It is the middle of the Great Depression in Savannah, Georgia. The year is 1933. It is the Jim Crow era and legalized government-sanctioned apartheid was the order of the day. I arrived the first of five children born in poverty to my courageous American Indian mother and my brave African American father. Circumstances could not have been more bleak. Allow me to share a brief descriptive excerpt from my book with you. All public places were segregated. Restaurants, movie theaters, schools, churches, <coughs> swimming pools, libraries, and the like. And Negroes had to ride in the back of the buses and trains. Signs on restaurant doors, water fountains, and restrooms said colored, or white, or white only. Sometimes additional signs said, no Negroes, Indians, or dogs allowed. We were not permitted to try on clothes or shoes in the stores and had to be careful not to bump into white people on the sidewalks. It was customary not to make eye contact with them and to defer to them on all matters, stepping off the sidewalk if necessary to allow them to pass. Not to do this was considered not knowing one's place and could result in dangerous confrontation or worse. One hot summer day when I was about five years old, my mother and I went shopping downtown. She had taught me to read, so I recognized the signs above the water fountains in the store. The sign above the sparkling clean water fountain with the shiny chrome faucet and handle said, white. A dirty, rusted out fountain in a dim corner had a sign above it that said colored. I knew from past experience that I was expected to drink from the dirty, rusted out fountain and that the water from it was warm and not refreshing. I stood contemplating the two water fountains as my mother browsed the merchandise under the watchful, suspicious eye of the white salesman. He appeared to be unaware of my presence since he was preoccupied with racially profiling my bronze-skinned mother. It seemed an opportune time and I gave in to the urge to take a drink of the cold water from the pristine, immaculate, white water fountain. I stepped up on the platform and turned the shiny handle. The cool, refreshing liquid slid down my parched throat like a sweet elixir. Sweeter still, because I had defiantly resisted the evil system of oppression in my own small, daring way. Still basking in the moment, I raised my head just in time to see a rotund, red-faced, rabid-looking, sweaty white woman looming toward me, screaming profanities. Get away, you little nigger, get, get, she roared. My mother jumped protectively between the woman and me and grabbed my tiny hand. The woman, seeing that my mother's skin did not match mine, said to my mother between a snarl and a smirk, where did you get that little black pickaninny? Her eyes held an inexplicable hardness and hate. My mother just glared at her and walked away with me in tow. Mother explained to me that it is sometimes better to walk away 
and live to fight another day in another way. The sweet spirit of resistance stayed with me nevertheless, and I have never lost it. So, how did I get from there to here? By the grace of God and through education. Through the years, my parents, teachers, and other pivotal people in my life impressed upon me the value of a good education and the importance of lifelong learning. I was told emphatically that education would help me pave the way out of poverty. As a person of color, I began to see that education would be crucial in teaching me to navigate the swirls and tides of racism and bigotry. Later, I began to understand that education would enable me to give back and to make a difference in the lives of others. I could not think of a nobler mission than to be able to contribute to making the world a better and more just and loving place. Our personal stories are part of history. History is not just about the famous people. It is made up of the ordinary, nameless heroes and sheroes who inhabit our planet as well. His story and her story blend to make America's story, encompassing black history, which is too often excluded. Sharing our stories with authenticity, candor, and integrity allows us to see and acknowledge our common humanity, to respect our individual identities as well as those of others, and to feel more grounded and connected in the world. Stories of the joys and dreams or the wounds and pains of others may teach us lessons and give us tools with which to face our own challenges and celebrate our victories. Hence, we become more tolerant, understanding, and compassionate towards others. Sharing our stories helps us to see with empathy that we are all connected and more alike than we are different. On this voyage through life, we may be on different decks of the ship because of economics, education, religion, race, or class, but ultimately we're all in the same boat and we sink or swim together. None of us travels through this universe alone. The past influences where we are today and how we got to this point in our common history, how we got to this Black History Month. Black History Month was started by Black historian, author, and journalist, Dr. Carter G. Woodson in the year 1926. It was a way to recognize the achievements of people of African descent and to include things that were excluded about us in American education and history books. Dr. Woodson selected the second week of February because it coincided with the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. When it first began, the celebration lasted for only one week, Negro History Week. Maybe someone realized that there were just too many good things to talk about in that short amount of time. So since 1976, every president, Democrat and Republican, has issued proclamations designating the entire month of February as Black History Month. It's a wonderful time to step back and recognize the many great gifts 
African Americans have brought to our nation. How different would our country be without the leaders and the myriad of common folk who fought for civil rights? These people helped us learn what real strength is, what perseverance is. They broke down barriers. They stood against injustice. They helped us pull together as a nation and overcome our darkest days. These people and so many others helped us build toward a greater nation where people are judged by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin. It's not just in civil rights that African Americans have made enormous impacts. Think about music, science, sports, art, politics, medicine, literature, entrepreneurship, education, and more. The list goes on and on. There are prominent African American names too numerous to mention in every single facet of American life today. There has been progress, to be sure, but it hasn't been an easy struggle. We don't have to go all the way back in history to slavery to see the effects of systemic, structural, and institutional racism in our country. We can go back to events that happened in the lifetimes of many people here. Some of you remember the court case Brown versus Board of Education, which should have ended school segregation in 1954. The laws kept coming to try to combat racism, but people kept on finding new ways to try to keep the status quo in place. Fortunately, other people, including faithful white allies who bravely stood beside us, kept on fighting to beat back the injustice, to beat back the segregation and discrimination perpetrated upon the black community. Many of those alliances continue today. That's part of why we gather here today to celebrate black history. We honor those who came before us. We celebrate how far we've come as a society. And we also honor those who continue to fight for justice. The struggle is far from over. We look at the past and applaud our predecessors for doing great things. It's easy to look back to the past and see who was on the right side of history, separated as we are by years and years. Hindsight is always 2020, as the saying goes. It is easy to stand here today and say, school segregation was wrong. Slavery was wrong. Denying people the right to vote was wrong. We must not forget that part of the abysmal tragedy of those times was the complicity of good people who stood by and watched as bad things happened, condoning evil by their silence. Too many good people remained neutral and looked the other way so they wouldn't have to do the difficult and the unpopular thing and stand up for what was right. In the words of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you say that you are neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. <laughs> in conclusion, 
I want to appeal to you today during this Black History Month to think of your place in history presently. Which side of history will you stand on? We all know that we still have a lot of problems and that many of those problems can be traced to racism. You only have to read the news or watch it on television in order to see how injustice still affects the black community today. Don't be neutral. Make a commitment that you will not look the other way when the elephant stands on the mouse's tail. Make a promise to yourself to speak up whenever you see injustice. I also want to ask you to listen. Engage people with experiences and views different from your own and share your perspective, but also listen. Listen with a kind heart and an open mind, not in anger. If we listen to each other, if we treat each other with respect and dignity, we can find ways to overcome our modern day problems together. I'd like to leave you with a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Let us all work together to be the light that drives out darkness. If we work together, we can continue to make great strides toward a better future. Thank you again for the honor of speaking with you today. It has truly been a pleasure. It's an honor for me to uh, be on the same program with Poco. I look forward to it. I look forward even more to what I'm going to say. I have no idea. <laughs> but I want to introduce you to the person who stayed with me all these years and in the civil rights movement was beside me. Betsy, would you just stand? Most interesting to me in all this is how a boy who grew up in a segregated city, went to a segregated school system, went to a segregated college in Virginia, and I ended up involving myself in the movement. I got lucky, very lucky. When we went to, uh, from Colorado University to Iowa State in 1961, the first lucky move that we made was when I was asked to be the advisor to something called United Campus Christian Fellowship. It's a campus ministries in colleges and universities back at least in the 60s. And what I learned very quickly was that I had signed up to be involved in the movement. That's the real luck that I had. And I soon became a member of uh, 15 people who were sort of the governing body for the UCCF, which was on hundreds of campuses throughout the United States. And the, what they were working on was issues involving the civil rights movement. So I just lucked in. 
And what happened with the 15 people we began meeting uh, in southern communities? I, uh, I had meetings in uh, Little Rock when there was an issue about a high school, recall that? In Jackson, Mississippi, Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, and then all of a sudden, at a general meeting held at the Michigan State University, for all the leaders around the country in the campus ministry and in uh, uh, student work, Betsy and I attended a movie one night rather than go to meetings. And when I came back from the movie, uh, somebody said, where were you? And I said, Betsy and I went to a movie. And he said, we've been elected president of the United, <laughs> the United Campus Christian Fellowship. I wish it were that easy today in presidential. <laughs> I'm not going to go there, folks. I had no more had another meeting in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, I think. And uh, I came back out of that and received a call from the National Churches, the Council of National Churches. And they said, we want you to head up our Commission on Higher Education of the Negro. I said, I, folks, do you realize I'm white? Yes, we know you're white, but you have contacts in many universities and colleges. You have contacts with civil rights leaders, and we think you'd be a perfect person to head up the commission. What is it you want me to do, I said. We want you to continue meeting as you're doing in the South with people black and white, and advise us on what we should do about higher education. Could you be more specific, I asked. Yes. We have a situation here where our college and universities, especially in the North, do not have enough Negro students nor Negro faculty. We need to correct that but there are some issues involved. Uh, well, I was a, an associate dean at Iowa State University, middle, middle. Why in the world do you want me to do that? You got, uh, they listened to all that and said, would you do that? Still, I said, yes. The meetings escalated, as Betsy will concur. I would spend a week at Iowa State and then late Friday afternoon, would drive down to Des Moines, get on a plane, and I'd head south. And we'd have meetings all over. I insisted all the meetings with civil rights leaders and university and college be on Saturdays so I could be back by Saturday night, have Sunday with my family before we started the week. That became a process for about three years. Uh, I would attend at least two meetings a, a month in the south meeting with higher education officials, leaders of, uh, uh, in the civil rights movements, blacks who I'd heard and read about, and then all of a sudden came 1964. UCCF decided that we would make a crack at Mississippi to register voters. It was called Freedom Summer, if some of you remember. Several thousand of our students in the UCCF went there, and by that time I thought, the parade is going and I'm not even in the parade. So Betsy and I talked about what we might do. And we decided the one thing I could do would be to teach down in the South at some black college. I called the president, whom I'd already met, at Tougaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi. In the civil rights movement, Tougaloo was the one college in the South we wanted to keep open, by all means, because that's where whites and blacks were meeting, all involved with civil rights. It was a very important college at that time. So I called the president and said, uh, can you use me? I can come down and teach, told him what I subjects I could teach in, he said, yo, yes, come on. We were going to Tougaloo in Jackson, Mississippi. 
The next week, we were not going to Tougaloo in Jackson, Mississippi. The president called, said, Ron, you can't come down. They're shooting on the campus. What he meant was that cars were driving by the campus located right in Jackson, Mississippi, and were firing shotguns and rifle shots into the campus. He said, we can't guarantee your safety. And furthermore, I've learned from the sheriff. And by the way, if you wonder who was shooting uh, deputy police. Uh, he said, if you and your family separated and they came off campus, they would be arrested. And the only way you could get them freed would be if you agree immediately to leave the state, to drive out of the state. He said, if you're arrested, you're going to sit there for a long time. So Betsy and I talked about and decided we're not going to Tougaloo. I called the president of uh, Tuskegee Institute. I had met him at uh, meetings, and I said, can you use us? I can come down and teach in these fields and so on. He said, yes, come on. So we went to Tuskegee Institute in the summer of 1964. I taught two graduate classes, one for six doctoral students, and I was going to the next class hoping I'd have at least six, and I had 93. Uh, that was a bit of a shock. I want to tell you some of what happened during that time that we were there, uh, because it's terribly important to us and to the black students uh, that I tried to teach. I walked into the class with the 93 students and thought I'd better get organized. So I said, I want you all to sit from here on every day. We're together in the same place you're sitting now. I had an assistant who made a, a list of where they all were. I said, I want to get acquainted with you. During that period of time, I decided, uh, even though I was teaching five days a week, that I would take uh, time to meet with them. I wanted to meet with every student. I was pretty sure I was the first white professor or teacher they'd ever had. In fact, it did prove out that way. And so I thought it was important for me to have uh, intercourse with them and talk about them life and for them to meet a white teacher. But I never told them I was white, which got pretty interesting. Because during, here's the first story. During the course of the uh, summer, I'd gone about... Uh, four weeks, had them talking with me about different issues and education that we had to deal with. These were students coming into the master's program in counseling and guidance, which my doctorate was in. And my course really was on understanding self, understanding human behavior. So in, the, in the, about the three weeks that we took, I'd interviewed every student except one woman and by the way, all these students were black, sat on the very back, didn't participate in any the discussions that we had during the, uh, the time. And all of a sudden, one day, she came up, uh, waited for all the other students to leave before she talked, said, Dr. Barnes, my, my husband and I have been talking, and we want to invite you and your family to dinner this Sunday. I'd had no conversation with her. I knew something wasn't tracking. So I said, please let me go home and talk to my wife and family and we'll, uh, please come and see me tomorrow. So after class tomorrow, and she still hadn't made any contribution in class, here she comes. And she waits till all the other students are gone. And she had tears in her eyes. Well, I figured it out very quickly because that class, I'd been three and a half weeks in there, was the first time I said to the class, by the way, what's it like for you to have a white teacher? Think now. She came up and said, Dr. Barnes, I didn't know. I didn't know you were white. I, I didn't know. Started crying. So did I. She said, I can't. We can't have you there. We'll be killed. She lived over in Augusta, Georgia, just across the line.
said, we'll be killed. I can't do it. I'm so embarrassed. I said, please don't be embarrassed. You give me a great compliment. I've been with three and a half weeks and I passed. <laughs> and I had. That was one of the stories. There were many others. The experiences our children had were in nursery school. They were four and seven. First day, they would go down. We take them down to the nursery school. It's on campus. There's no prejudice among children, folks. We went two hours later to see how they were doing. Our daughter was on a teeter board, getting bumped up and down with a little girl. Our son was pushing a little black kid and running around yelling works perfectly at that age, which is something to think about. Well, we lived in the house right across from campus with two other black families. And up on our level was Mrs. Logan, the first woman ever hired by Booker T. Washington to start the nursery school for Tuskegee Institute. A lovely, lovely woman. We had so many wonderful discussions with her, but the one that we remember and I shared in a movie that was made of, of what we, uh, our experiences, is this story. I was teaching with my other group. Betsy was in studying. She t took a course from Dr. Charles Gomillion. Uh, you might remember a court case, went to the civil court, Gomillion versus Lightfoot. In Tuskegee, they tried to redraw the boundary lines so that the whites would have all of the uh, positions of government and the blacks would have none. It went to the Supreme Court and Gomillion beat Lightfoot, the white mayor of Tuskegee. Famous case. Wonderful man. He was advisor to President Kennedy and President Johnson. Betsy took a course in social social action, social affairs, sociology of some kind that he taught. And tell this story on Dr. Gamillion first. Betsy and Dr. Gamillion were talking one day after class. Now this is the most famous man in that part of the state of, of uh, Georgia, of uh, Alabama. And he said, you know, Mrs. Barnes, I'm over 60 years old. I've lived here all my life. And I've never been called by a white person, Dr. Gomillion, or Mr. Gomillion, or Charles. He was always addressed as boy. You want a pair of shoes, boy? Well, this story I must tell Mrs. Logan. We'd been there about a week and a half. Now, Mrs. Logan is the kind of woman who does not know how to whisper. We're on the same level, and we could hear her all the time. Betsy is there studying for Dr. Gomillion's course, course, and we hear Mrs. Logan go out in the hall because her television man is coming up the stairs. He's black as well. We were the only whites in the whole area. And she whispered to him, Say! He said, What? We've got a white family living with us up here. No. Yes. And you know what? What? They're very nice. <laughs> no. Yes. And you know what? What? It just goes to show you can't believe everything you hear about them. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. One other quick story. We went to dinner one night with a family. He was the assistant dean of the College of Education where I was teaching. And it was a, a lovely family, and we knew them well. Except when we came to sit down to have a drink before dinner, Mrs. B, our caller, 
brought the drinks, left. Flitted in and out. During the dinner, we'd talk, she'd get up and leave. And it, after dinner, we talked for a little while. She was very uncomfortable. Get up and leave. Come back. So we decided we would get a two with our two children, leave and go back. It not, had not been the best evening, but, uh, and I, I thought I'd make one more crack at her. So as we were leaving, I signaled Betsy to go take the, our two children on out with Dr. B. And I said, Mrs. B, I'm sorry. I know you're very uncomfortable. I hope it's nothing we said or did. She said, oh no, oh no. She's not you, it's me. And she told a story. I've been offered a full fellowship to the University of Michigan. She was a teacher, educator, for next year. And I, we wanted you over here because I wanted to know if I could meet with whites on my own turf and talk with them and be comfortable. So you were a test. So no, you didn't do anything wrong. It's me and I, I don't know what to do. So we talked a little bit more. And we had no contact with Dr. B and his family for a year and then we were having dinner one night in, in Ames, Iowa, still at Iowa State. And we got a call and it was Mrs. B. And she said, uh, Ron, uh, I took that scholarship. Uh, I've been at Michigan. I'm on my way back, and I'm going back home. Uh, I'd, I'd like to come see you. I said, sure. When can you come? She says, well, I'm 20 minutes away. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I said, please come up. So she we talked. So we passed the test with her, and we became friends. And it was those kind of experiences that we had. But the main one came of what happened because of my work and the work of others with regard to higher education. And this is the last story. In January of 1965, in Chicago at the huge Hilton Hotel was the first meeting ever of presidents of the black colleges and presidents and chief executives of the white colleges and universities. And the conversation centered around how can we work together for the benefit of both. The concern that the, chamber, that the National Council of Churches had was that in the 60s there were 117 predominantly Negro colleges in the United States almost all in the Deep South, the rest in the border states. The white universities and colleges were being criticized for not having black professors, enough black students, and so on. The concern of the National Council of Churches was those white colleges and universities pay salaries three to four times what the salaries are of those professors at predominantly black colleges in the South. They could raid us and destroy us. And we all knew that those black colleges, every one of which had a religious affiliation of one kind or another, could be destroyed. And their, what they were doing was so important for the black youngsters in those areas. So that was a concern that we never talked about publicly, but that was a concern of the National Council of Churches. We do not want to destroy those black colleges that are so important to what's going on. So what happened was what, and I'd written one paper suggesting move this way, I'm sure others did as well, was that we have exchanges. You see, when I taught there in the summer of 1964, I released a black professor to go north to a university to work on his doctorate. And that's what they did. And that's what happened out of that meeting that was so critical. Alliances were set up and in, they would exchange for a semester or a year, sometimes exchanging homes of a white professor and his family go down and live in the home of a black professor and his family and they'd exchange, sometimes even cars. 
And this is what worked out and became a major kind of emphasis. So I was so pleased that I had a hand in that because it, it meant so much to us to have had the experience in that black college. We still have friends uh, from there. Thank you. Okay, so at this time, we will take questions from the audience. First of all, thank you both. You're both amazing. This is really more rhetorical to both of you. So much of what a lot of us did in the 50s and 60s was wonderful, was great, and we moved ahead. It doesn't seem to be happening anymore, not with the intensity when we were all involved. So the rhetorical question is, how do we get that passion back? Mm. <laughs> Ron is taking that question. Oh, you get the next one. <laughs> John first. <laughs> I, I don't know how to answer that. I've never lost a passion. Uh, it's as strong now as it ever has been. Um, for, for me, yes. Yes. Can you do anything with that? <laughs> I, I have to agree with you, Ron. For me, the passion has never died. Um, if anything, as I've aged, as I've aged, mine has increased because I've, I guess, become either braver or more foolish. <laughs> uh, I think some of you know that I started uh, 26 years ago the um, PAL, Prescott Area Leadership. The thing that I tell every year to these people is, I believe that the primary characteristic of an effective leader, and we don't talk about leaders because we're not interested in producing leaders. We have enough leaders in this world. Look at the condition of the world. So we talk about effective leadership. The first thing I tell them is, I think the most important quality of an effective leader is character. And I must tell you, when I listen to the presidential, I think I've got to be right on that one. Other questions? Hi, Poco. I know you've had some experiences in Prescott yourself um, around along racial issues and stuff. Could you share them, a couple of them with, with the folks here? I did not hear that in your story. Oh my, where do I begin? <laughs> well, um, racism today is not like it was when I was a kid. Today it's more covert, it's more subtle. You, you feel it. Um, well, one example that comes to mind is shopping. Generally, when I go shopping, I take a very small purse because I know that I'm being watched. And if I have a large purse suspected of stuffing things in my purse, so I figure I'll get hassled less if I have a, a small purse that won't contain much. <laughs> Um, my husband and I sometimes have gone to restaurants where the service has been questionable, we're seated near the kitchen and ignored for a long time, um, or we'll walk in together hand in hand and they'll say, are you two together? <laughs> Um, just, I guess, what you would call little things, but can be very irritating when they happen over and over and over again. Um, 
<laughs> if you want to hear about things that are maybe are a little more serious than that, um, if a noose hanging from the tree in your front yard is serious, yes, we've had that. As regard to uh, how can we bring the passion back, people need to talk. People need to socialize. People need to share experience. Through the socializing, people learn. And people come to listen instead of vociferating words, empty wording and empty mouths. I quite agree. We need to listen and to talk to each other. I think one of the things that we as white people can do is to become conscious, aware of our white privilege. The so-called little things that Poco mentioned, if you think about what you don't have to, what we don't have to focus on, what we don't have to be conscious of, what the freedom that we have to just go about using our energies in different ways instead of having to be self-conscious and carry a smaller purse because someone might think we're stealing. I, when I was in graduate school, we read an article that stayed with me. It was written by white women who started out writing about male privilege. And as they researched and wrote, they realized how much white privilege they as white women had compared to or in opposition to the experiences of people of color. And I, th I think when you become self-aware, then you can be more understanding, more empathic and for other people. Hi. Um, I just wanted to remind you all of the mural situation that we had a few years ago. Um, and another person of a color, another person of color shared with me that she, she was a Prescott College student and she was walking down the street and a, a black car was slowly following her and uh, she was not real close to home, but they yelled out the window, the N-word, at her, and she ran, she ran the rest of the way home. This is just in the last couple of years. So we have, we have racism here in Prescott, um, and we just need to stand up and recognize it and do something about it.